And uh, welcome all of you to Estate Planning Basics, uh, my monthly webinar for the month of April. And uh, I thought estate planning would be appropriate in April as uh, uh, many folks are uh, uh, doing a lot of work with taxes this month. If you haven't filed already, you've, you've got, uh, what, another week, maybe 10 days or so. Uh, but uh, as people are already thinking about taxes in April, I thought it would be a great month to bring up uh, some of the taxes and fees that uh, people's families may face uh, upon their deaths, uh, and, and uh, including the estate tax, but uh, I didn't want to limit it uh, to only the estate tax. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there are so many other taxes out there that a lot of times we forget about. And uh, certainly with the new estate tax law, um, raising that bar to $5 million, there's going to be a lot less people affected by the actual estate tax uh, than what there was uh, just a short time ago. And uh, so it still gives you a great opportunity to go in there and talk to people about how they can uh, avoid unnecessary taxes. And with proper planning, you can certainly help your clients do that. And uh, I want to go over three uh, uh, different levels of uh, tax planning, uh, or a t tax avoidance, maybe a legal tax avoidance, let's say. Uh, starting off with uh, things that are very, very basic. These are items you can talk to anybody about, and uh, we're going to be talking about beneficiary reviews. If uh, beneficiaries on life insurance policies are not set up properly, uh, it, it can really mess with uh, what people had intended uh, once they pass on. Uh, going up another level, uh, we'll talk briefly about wealth transfer. These are people that uh, uh, they're not in that category where they need to worry about the estate tax just yet, but they do have more money uh, than they need to live on in retirement, and uh, there, there are smart ways and not so smart ways to pass that money on to the next generation. And then I'll, I'll touch briefly on uh, the new estate tax, uh, the law that was just uh, uh, passed, I believe, in December, and raising that threshold uh, to uh, to $5 million. Um, not only will I, I go over these ideas, but uh, I want to give you some ideas that will work to put you in front of people, uh, give ideas as to who is going to be receptive to this, what kinds of clients in your, uh, your client files uh, will be receptive, and, and uh, maybe some phrases you can use with them, uh, some questions to ask them to get them interested. So starting off with basic beneficiary arrangements, uh, you know, uh, it, it's very easy to, uh, when you're conducting a review, to ask the clients to bring out their existing policies and uh, take a look at those beneficiary arrangements. In fact, this is one of the most common things that, that is, is uh, messed up on a life insurance policy. I know when I was out selling, I, I uh, heard from a lot of folks when I got to the beneficiary section, uh, I asked, well, who would you like me to put? Should I put your spouse or, or who are you putting down as primary beneficiary? And uh, I got this answer a lot. Oh, just put my estate down. We'll just have it go to my estate, or maybe they'll uh, they'll have that down as a contingent beneficiary, and uh, that, that's really not something you want to do. Uh, there's got to be a lot of policies out there that still have the estate listed as the beneficiary. So, what's the problem with putting the estate down as beneficiary? Well, it, it causes an asset that would normally avoid probate now to go through probate. Now, probate uh, uh, comes from a Latin term, and it, it means to prove. So uh, it's, it's a process of proving the will. Uh, attorneys get involved. In fact, attorneys get uh, well, their fee for uh, uh, going through probate and helping with that is a percentage of all the assets that are running through probate. So uh, the more money that goes through there, the more money the attorney gets, the less money moves on to your client's heirs. And uh, I don't think that's what many people want unless they're in a family of attorneys. Uh, and I, I mentioned, too, the contingent beneficiary. Let's say husband and wife are killed in a car accident. Contingent beneficiary is the estate. Well, now uh, that death benefit uh, has to go through probate. An attorney gets a piece of it, and uh, it's also delayed. Uh, you know, the courts are going to move as fast as they're going to move. I know we have a shortage of uh, judges in this country right now, and uh, things will be delayed even more. If you'd like your, your heirs to get the money quickly, do not put the estate as uh, the beneficiary. Uh, one thing uh, related to that, too, is uh, a trust. Uh, a lot of folks will have a testamentary trust set up. Now, a testamentary trust uh, is, uh, goes into effect uh, when a person dies, and it's uh, 
that goes into effect because of the will or their last will and testament. And uh, again, the will has to go through probate before that trust can come into being. Uh, so if um, the money is going to a testamentary trust, we're going to see delays there as well. Uh, another common mistake with beneficiary arrangements, and, and that's naming minor children. Uh, I get that question a lot, uh, and uh, people want to name their minor children as, as beneficiaries, usually as, as uh, contingent beneficiaries, and uh, that's generally not a good thing either. Uh, each state has their own age of majority, at, at which a child will be able to receive and take full control of that money. However, prior to that, it's up to the courts. They are going to decide uh, who, uh, who handles the money and uh, how much the children are going to receive uh, makes a lot more sense. Uh, if you can avoid that delay, put down a trusted family member who uh, will take on that responsibility or have a trust set up ahead of time uh, that will handle all of that. But you don't want the courts deciding uh, how often and, and when your children uh, get the money. They're going to decide what's convenient to the court, not necessarily what's in the best interest of the children. And uh, uh, third uh, common question I get regarding uh, beneficiary arrangements, this involves uh, business entities. And uh, you, know, you want to make sure that there, if it's a buy-sell arrangement or a key person arrangement, uh, that it's done correctly. Uh, a lot of people will make the mistake here and, and uh, turn a non-taxable benefit uh, into a, a taxable benefit. And we sure don't want that. Uh, maybe it, it's a, a policy the business owner is taking out uh, for the benefit of, of a, a key employee, uh, sort of a bonus, and uh, uh, the business will pay for it. They'll deduct it. Uh, the employee's spouse is the beneficiary. Well, if they're not 1099-ing that employee for that cost, then that spouse is going to get a taxable debt benefit, and uh, we don't want to have that uh, happen. Uh, another thing to watch, too, would be with buy-sell arrangements. Uh, if you've got business owners, uh, you want to make sure that if they already have policies in place or if you're writing a new one, that uh, the beneficiaries are arranged properly. Uh, in a cross-purchase arrangement, usually with two owners, you want to have each owner be the, um, the owner and beneficiary of a policy on the other owner's life. And uh, that gives them control over that policy, and, and things will work as spelled out in that buy-sell arrangement. Um, with uh, multiple owners, a lot of times it, uh, it's common to have uh, the business be the owner and beneficiary of the buy-sell arrangement. Uh, that, that, that's okay. Uh, it keeps you from having to write uh, 12, 15, maybe 20 different policies. But if there's just two owners, uh, there's no need to have the business be the owner on that. Uh, what could happen there? If, if the business owns uh, the policies and is the beneficiary, yeah, the business is going to, uh, they're going to be able to buy back the shares um, of the business from uh, the uh, deceased uh, partner. But uh, the remaining owners do not see a corresponding increase in their basis. And uh, so they're, they're faced with a, a potential capital gain uh, when they go to sell the business. So that, not a good idea, but you want to make sure that those are set up properly. So uh, some ideas on who to speak to on this or, or ways to get in front of people. Uh, first off is the beneficiary review. Uh, you know, a lot of folks, uh, in fact, I think our most common method that uh, generates business is off of annual reviews or policy reviews, whether they're your clients or they're somebody else's clients. And one great way to get in the door is uh, to ask the question, uh, you know, when was the last time we reviewed your beneficiary arrangements? Or uh, if it's a new client to you, uh, you know, have, have you reviewed the beneficiary arrangements on your policies? You know, if you took them out 10, 20 years ago, do you know who's listed as the beneficiary? You know, that's a common problem we see, and uh, it's a common mistake people make. Let's sit down, bring out your policies, and let's make sure that you have them arranged in the manner that you really intended. And uh, that'll get you in the door. You have an opportunity to look at their policies. Again, this works for individuals and businesses. And uh, lo and behold, you might be able to recommend uh, better policies for them than what they have. Uh, maybe it's a term that's going to expire. You can help them convert it. Uh, maybe it's an old UL that's uh, going to be blown up pretty soon. You can help save that, maybe get them into something new. And uh, of course, uh, chances are their needs have changed. And, and today, they likely need a lot more coverage and you can help them uh, 
with that additional policy. Uh, for additional information on the beneficiary reviews, uh, I know American General has a fact finder available uh, specific to beneficiary reviews. They also have uh, pre-approved client letters and they have a postcard if you're looking for materials to be able to send out to people. Um, the other idea with uh, beneficiary reviews, I got this from uh, uh, from another producer and it's uh, asking for uh, uh, referrals off of the beneficiary uh, part of the application. Uh, imagine that you're sitting down with the client and you get to that part of the application and you're asking for the beneficiaries and they give you names of their uh, adult children. Well, all the carriers are concerned about are the names, maybe the social security number uh, of that person and then uh, you write it down, you turn in the app. That's the last you think of it. Well, it makes a lot of sense to ask for additional information uh, on those people uh, so that you can contact them. And what you want to do is be able to send them a letter explaining that uh, you know their their parents or or whomever just took out a life insurance policy. And you are the agent. Uh, you've got information on that policy, and uh, you know that when when their loved one passes away, that you're certainly available to help them uh, with that claims process and uh, help them decide you know you know how they're going to receive the money, maybe what to do with it when they come into that large lump sum, you know, make your, yourself available. Now, uh, what this does is it sets you out there as uh, the trusted advisor. Uh, when they come across a life insurance need or, or an annuity need or a long-term care need, uh, you've got your foot in the door as an agent that they already know that's helped out a relative of theirs. And it gives you an opportunity to, to call them, introduce yourself to them uh, as a resource. Now, moving on to uh, uh, folks that are um, yeah, maybe a, a little better off, uh, the beneficiary review idea you can use with anybody out there, you know, whether they have a lot of money or not, as long as they have a life insurance need and a life insurance policy, it works. Uh, it's not limited to, to low income. You could talk to middle income and high income folks as well. Uh, but uh, the wealth transfer idea, uh, there are taxes uh, that can be avoided here for people that have more money than they need uh, to live on. Uh, in their retirement years. And uh, people you want to look for here are uh, clients, prospects that have money in CDs. Uh, they're paying taxes every year on that. Uh, if they have money in annuities, if they don't plan on spending that in their lifetime, that money is going to continue to grow. The longer it grows, uh, the higher, uh, the greater taxable event their heirs are going to face uh, when they pass away. Uh, you especially we want to key in on people that are taking required minimum distributions. I mean, they're, they're taking the money not because they need to, but because the government says they have to uh, take that money out of a qualified plan. And uh, uh, these people would be prime candidates. And uh, all you've got to do is ask them uh, you know, when you're uh, reviewing uh, all of their safe money, ask them what that money is, is for. Now, you may already know this if you've uh, put together their retirement plan. Uh, but some simple questioning will reveal a lot. And they'll probably tell you, well, we have this CD at this bank. That's earmarked for this grandchild. And this one's for this grandchild. Or this annuity, we, we want to pass that on to our children. Well, if, if that's the case, uh, they're paying a lot of taxes that they don't have to. Uh, so the idea is it makes a lot of sense to move that money out of the CD now or pull the money out of that annuity. There's going to be a taxable event there likely, but far better to pay a little bit of tax now rather than a lot of tax later on. So the money is moved into a life insurance policy, a single premium. It can be a MEC, a modified endowment contract. That's fine. Uh, receives the same tax treatment as an annuity would. So they, they haven't worsened the situation there. But now you've got some positive leverage. Let's say they had 50 grand. Uh, in that other vehicle. You've now turned it into uh, probably $100,000 of death benefit. It's going to pass to their heirs completely tax-free. You don't need to wait for that asset to grow to that amount. If they die tomorrow, the heirs are getting that full hundred grand. Uh, also, uh, that growth from 50 to 100, it's now no longer taxable. Uh, Uncle Sam is not going to reach in there and get a piece of that. That's all going to go uh, to their heirs immediately. Now, uh, carers have developed a couple different ways to handle this. Uh, many have uh, specific wealth transfer products available. Uh, these are single premium only, and they're non-medical. Your client doesn't have to worry about a pyramid exam. Uh, these are typically uh, written on seniors, and uh, they might not 
want the inconvenience of going through an exam. This is much, much simpler and uh, usually means a very quick turnaround uh, on the underwriting side of things. Now, of course, if a client wants to go through full underwriting, they can get a lot more bang for their buck. If they're in great shape and don't mind going through that exam, you know, by all means, let's look at the most competitive no lapse guarantee UL product on the market or, or single premium whole life and put them in there and give them the absolute most leverage uh, they can get for their dollars. Now, a uh, uh, couple ideas here as far as who to, who to talk to. I already mentioned some of that, uh, but uh, one question I, I stole from my annuity counterparts here is, uh, you know, where do you keep your safe money? The, you know, the money you can't afford to lose. Hopefully you're already asking people that question, but uh, that can then lead to the follow-up. You know, what's the purpose of, the, of this money? And uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, gather from them. If it's really needed for retirement purposes, uh, maybe it's meant to pass on to the next generation. Uh, maybe it's needed for long-term care needs, too, and, that, and that's a, a totally different uh, direction you can go with that. Um, now, one of our carriers has some additional information for you on, on the whole wealth transfer um, idea, and uh, ING has developed several microsites, but one of them you want to take a look at is ingwealthtransfer.com. They have presentations, they have fact finders, they have uh, cover letters, you name it. ingwealthtransfer.com is a great resource to, to learn more about this. And uh, moving on to the, uh, the next level, and uh, this is the estate tax itself. We, we've covered uh, income taxes that uh, might be payable. We've covered probate expenses and, and delays in, in, in receiving money. Uh, but now the new, new estate tax, uh, several carriers have been putting on webinars uh, uh, since the beginning of the year. So I'm, I'm not going to go into too great a detail, but to give a, a really quick synopsis, uh, the new law sets the threshold at $5 million. If you're worth less than that, uh, you don't have to worry about paying the estate tax. Now, uh, they did simplify the carryover. It used to be uh, husband and wife were each eligible for uh, the specified exemption amount and uh, assets had to be titled in their names. That's no longer the case. You can carry over uh, money from one spouse to another, and you don't have to worry about having that uh, named in, in each one of their names ahead of time. Um, a couple of things to consider there, though. Uh, the carryover to the spouse is only available if an estate tax return is filed uh, upon the first death. Now, even though no estate tax is owed at that first death, you must file uh, the estate tax return in order to get that carryover to the remaining spouse. Now, done right, that means that each couple uh, can get up to $10 million of exemption. Anything over the $10 million would be subject to the estate tax. And also, you can only carry over one spouse. If uh, uh, the widow or widower decides to remarry, they cannot carry over again uh, to that second spouse. And then keep in mind, too, this is a two-year patch. Uh, it's in effect for 2011 and 2012 and 2013. Who knows what uh, what they'll decide to do? Now, uh, some of the the planning tools uh, that uh, we used to use uh, still hold true today. Uh, if people are, are going to be over that $10 million threshold, uh, you can avoid that uh, first and foremost by gifting to other people, relatives, charities. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd throw my name in the hat there too if, if I were you. If they're looking for extra people to give money to. Uh, by all means. But anyway, uh, if they can give that money away uh, ahead of time, that will help. Uh, now, if they can't give away enough or don't want to, uh, then, of course, as uh, life insurance producers, we can uh, step in there and help with the survivorship policy uh, inside of an irrevocable life insurance trust. And uh, that takes uh, some figuring ahead of time to uh, figure out the thresholds, how much they'll need. But that's still a tool that's uh, certainly available. So who do you want to talk to about this? Well, uh, anybody that's worth over $10 million as a couple. And uh, some people to, uh, to key in on there, I, I would think, would be business owners, and including uh, farmers and ranchers. I know some folks uh, in on the, the webinar uh, live in rural areas. And you know, it, it's amazing. You have a farmer come to town in, in the overalls and, and uh, mud on his boots. And uh, you wouldn't think the guy's got two nickels to rub together. But uh, you look out at the farm, the ranch, you, you uh, add up the value of the cattle, the land, all the equipment, uh, machinery, the tractors, the combines, uh, all the outbuildings out there, 
and lo and behold, they've got an estate tax problem. And uh, it'd be really tough for their heirs uh, to come up with the money to help pay that. And they've got to sell off the equipment, sell off the land, sell off the livestock. And uh, if that happens, then uh, the farm or ranch can no longer function uh, as it did previously. Same thing goes for a business owner. They have a building. They have all the equipment in there. Uh, you don't want to be selling that stuff off to help pay the estate tax. Uh, the business would certainly uh, uh, have a rough go of it and might even go under. Uh, so you want to be talking to business owners, uh, the prime uh, prospects. And uh, you know, really, uh, like I said before, any high net worth individuals in the community, uh, if you want a resource to help find those, uh, I, I would suggest a couple of things. One would be pairing up with local CPAs, also um, local attorneys. They're going to know who's got the money in the community. Uh, if you haven't already been referred to these people, and if you really need to, uh, places like Sales Genie and Info USA, they can provide uh, lists of people uh, based upon income. And uh, so, to recap uh, on uh, estate planning basics, uh, you know, uh, you know, the the estate tax is, is certainly one tax that people uh, might face upon their deaths, but there are other taxes and fees that are out there a lot of people just forget about. And uh, that includes uh, probate fees to an attorney. We don't want any more money going through probate uh, than what we really need to. And we sure don't want uh, those death benefit proceeds to be delayed. Uh, our beneficiaries uh, need the money, and they need it uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, for folks that have more money than they need to live on in retirement, uh, you know, they might have great plans for that, but uh, Uncle Sam might step in and get his piece of those plans we can help them with some real basic planning on the front end to make sure that uh, as much of that money as possible moves on to the heirs, to that next generation as they intended. Uh, and then, of course, uh, at the upper level, uh, we have a new estate tax law uh, in place now for the next two years, $10 million per couple. Uh, make sure you're still talking to those folks about that. And uh, if it's still in play, uh, they might uh, uh, be getting up to that level uh, in the next couple of years here. And uh, so now um, I guess I'll, I'll ask if anybody has any questions out there. Uh, you can certainly type them in and um, I'll do my very best to answer them here. And I'll wait just a couple of seconds here. I don't have any questions that have come through just yet. Keep in mind that uh, you can give me a call here. I'll be here uh, the rest of the week at 800-397-9999. My extension, as my, many of you know, is 3371. And uh, you probably have my email on file, too. And I can get you more details on the websites uh, I mentioned there as well. So um, I guess I'll wrap it up. I'd like to thank you all for attending. And uh, be sure and catch next month's webinar the first Wednesday of the month of May. topic will be hybrid life long-term care policies. Um, have yourself a great day.